Welcome back to this afternoon's presentation where we're going to be looking at herbs. But what I'm going to cover first of all is pain. Pain is debilitating. When someone is in tense pain, uh, they almost can't think properly. And so what we need to find out is why the pain is there. That's the first thing to ask when someone is in pain. Why is the pain there? And the sort of questions that you would first ask is, um, has anything ever happened to that area? And I'm going to use an illustration that we experienced this morning. And one of our dear sisters said that she'd had so much pain in her knee last night that she was actually walking in the forest. She was crying. She had so much pain. And do you know that early this morning when I was praying to God with my divine appointment, with the, with the master healer, with the greatest physician the world has ever known, I felt impressed to speak on pain. So isn't that interesting that our dear sister had, had that pain? And so this morning we went and saw where was the pain? It was in her knee. So the next question is, anything ever happened to that knee? Oh dear, lots has happened to that knee. And I won't go into fine details, but a very serious car accident where um, our dear sister was, I think, the only one to survive. It was such a severe accident. And she was only 15 at the time. But there was some very major damage to the point where that knee has had 13 operations. Am I right? about 13 operations. Whoa, there's, there's a lot happening in that knee. And now it is very, very sore. So then why, why would it have been so sore last night? And then we talk about maybe the fact that our dear sister has been sitting all day and usually she moves around a bit. Well, wouldn't it be better for her knee, the fact that it got a rest? Well, sometimes it can be that because there's not a lot of movement happening, there's not a lot of blood and lymph going through the knee that would usually be going through the knee. See, there's, there's a time to rest <laughs> and there's a time to work the leg. And this is something that is very important to understand, is that when someone's healing, there is a time to rest, but there is a time to work it because what's the healer? The healer in the human body is the life of the flesh, and that is the blood. And so movement encourages movement of blood in and out of that area. So we sort of come to the conclusion that it's been unusual for, for this lady to be sitting down <laughs> most of the day. And I'll put my knee, sorry, my hand over the knee, and I felt a fire. Right, so use your hand. You can feel your hand to feel. Now, leg down and leg above were warm, but this was a fire. <laughs> this was incredibly hot. And she had some ice on that, but there's something far more effective than that. See, water is the best conductor of hot and cold. And I read about this simple remedy. They say it's one of the first hydrotherapy remedies that was ever done. And it's a bowl of cold water with two washers, or you might call them face cloths. Wring it out and put it over the knee. It'll warm up quite quickly, and then you turn it over. And then as soon as that warms up, you get the other one. And when that face cloth warms up, where's the heat coming from? The knee. The knee. Most pain is due to inflammation. Not all pain, but most pain is due to inflammation. So the number one thing you've got to do is get that inflammation down. And so the beauty of those cold, wet cloths is it's pulling the heat out. And so we did that for half an hour. And I would like to suggest, and um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, would your pain have been 8 out of 10 when I came to you this morning? 8 out of 10? Yeah, 8 out of 10. Now that's pretty... That's pretty bad. And we could also tell, you know, when someone's in that much pain, the, the body tenses against it. So you can, you can often see that. 
And so as we put the cold cloths on, the, you know, that was beginning to bring a little bit of relief. Not a lot at first, a little bit of relief. And then the emotions came out. And then the emotions of everything that happened around that knee, <laughs> in the pain it can bring back to the memory, the pain of the loss, the, the situation around it. So then as medical missionaries, that's when we comfort. That's when we hug. You know, in Ecclesiastes uh, 3, it says, in verse 5, it says, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. This was a time to embrace. And so then that, that is dealt with. And then she had some warm sisters around her who were, who were joining in with, with her grief there. And we continued with the hot and coals. And the pain, the pain started to, to come down a little bit more and a little bit more. And then we suggested the knee be put up. So it put on a chair. And then in the break, which was probably about an hour later, we did a grated ginger poultice. Remember, gingers for joints. So we did a grated ginger poultice and we laid it on that area on the knee and asked God to bless it. Unfortunately, while my eyes were closed in prayer, I didn't realise that I was holding the leg in a position that was uncomfortable. If I'd been awake, I might have quickly adjusted it, but she smiled and we got that right. Okay, a couple of hours later, we're all going for our morning swim after our lecture down in the creek. And I said, it would be good for you to come. And she gladly came because she loves swimming. And she was laughing. What does the laughing tell you? The pain has come right down, right, right down. And I took the poultice off and encouraged her to dive in the cool water. And she came out of the cool water, oh, so happy because she loves swimming. And on our way back, she said three out of ten. Three out of ten. And we could just about tell that by, by body language. Now, can you see this is not happening very quick? But what we've got there is a very chronic problem. And our sister felt a little bit bad that she was the attention of it. She centre of attention there. But I said, this is very good. This is very good for the students. Very good for the students. And I also said, I am so glad this happened here. Because now you know what to do when you go home. It's those cold cloths. How simple is that? So if there's no ice, and by the way, in that situation, the cold cloths are better because the water from those cold cloths is taking, is taking the inflammation out of that knee. Such a simple treatment. And so tonight, and we do hope it doesn't happen tonight, but tonight she knows exactly what to do. It usually takes about half an hour before the fire that almost felt like a volcano in the middle of that knee before it, it, it comes down. So that's something to remember in pain, that, that pain is often due to inflammation, not always. And that's why, remember, the first thing you do is you investigate. Whenever there's a problem, you investigate the cause. And that's what you'll find, there's often an old injury. And of course you can't change that, but it explains why this is happening. And the more chronic the situation, sometimes the, the, the longer it takes to, to actually respond because it is so chronic. But we got a very beautiful response uh, from that. So it's a very simple situation and quite a serious one. You will not meet many people with such a serious uh, injury. And when you've got a medical missionary who's got such injuries, do you know that's a perfect medical missionary? Because that medical missionary has history and experience that she can share. And what you'll also find is that many will listen because they know what you have been through. And as I said to our dear sister, it is a miracle that you are alive. And it is a miracle that you can walk. Do you know, it's all what you compare it to. And now she has a, a very powerful story to share. And it says in, um, 
Revelation chapter 12, and I think it's about verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. So your, your testimony, you, you don't need a lot of qualifications for that. This, this has really helped me. This made a huge, huge difference for me. So often when people are experiencing pain, they said to me, have you got a natural painkiller? Because we are so used to taking a drug to kill the pain that, that many people just want the herb to kill the pain. But that's not how natural medicine works. What natural medicine does is they investigate why, why, that, why that pain is there. And I mentioned yesterday there is a herb that has quite a dramatic uh, analgesic, and an analgesic basically is a painkiller, and that is cane pepper. But I didn't even think of cane pepper in this case because I knew that all we had to do was get the fire out of that knee and the pain would go down. And I mentioned it about the man who got his hand caught in a roller. Oh, his, you know, that, that was very painful. And so he, you know, it's waiting for that to begin to heal. Ice can also kill pain. I have had people, and you see, not always, because what you what you do is you you are you see the response. So remember, we're looking at history, and this is when you investigate. We're looking at history. We're looking at symptoms, symptoms, and we're looking at response. So the response tells you, are you on the right track? I raised six children, six children. And what worked for one didn't always work for the other <laughs> in just training and raising the children. So what you look for is, is response. Response is very important. So with this man with his hand caught in the roller, the cane pepper made a, a huge difference. He said equal to, a, to quite a serious painkiller. So that's impressive. Yes, it tingles a bit, but that settles down, yes? On the outside. Yep, yep. Meaning, um, oh, no, inside. <laughs> we did do a little bit on his fingers. Remember they were talking of amputating it, and that was bringing the blood to the area. But as a painkiller, I'm sorry I misunderstood that, you take it on the inside. And so the best way really is to just... Uh, half a teaspoon, a little bit of water, and throw it down. You might gag a little bit, it'll catch a little bit, but you're, when you're in pain, um, you, you'll happily take it. There's an excellent book called The Gift of Pain by Dr. Paul Brand. Notice the title to his book, The Gift of Pain. Oh, I think there's a T on the end. Try it without and try it with. And he gives a story about when he was in a hospital in India, he, he had gallstones and he was very busy. He couldn't have them attended to. And he woke up one, for a couple of weeks. So he woke up one night and he was in the most incredible pain. So he got up and he walked barefoot round and round the hospital grounds barefoot. And he said the paths had cracked shells over them. And you can imagine that barefoot. It was a little painful. But he said it just took the edge off the pain here. <laughs> he said it just shifted his mind. And he said, I, I, I often wonder what anyone would think seeing the head surgeon walking around in his pyjamas barefoot in the middle of the night around the, the paths that had the cracked up shells on them. But he said by the time he got back, the pain had come from 8 out of 10 pain down to about 5 out of 10 pain and he could get to sleep. And one writer said it like this, do you know what an aspirin is? He said it's like you're walking along and you pick up a stick and you get a splinter in there and ah, oh, it really hurts and you're going along and then you kick your toe. And that hurts even more, you don't even feel hardly the splinter anymore, that often a especially aspirin causes a stomach bleed for it to be abs absorbed. And he explained it that, you know, you've the pain in there and you don't actually feel the pain, but it's a reaction 
to the body to ease the other pain. I also talked this, talk this morning about your natural painkiller that is released in your brain in the night season between the hours of the moment. It's summer, so it's 10 and 3. And exercising in the day to release the waste from using your natural painkiller, so you've got another dose, dose at night. Also being well hydrated. If you're in pain, it can intensify if you're dehydrated. So that's coming back also to the eight laws of health. So is there a natural painkiller? Probably the closest is cayenne pepper. Yes? Is it possible, possible to overdo the cayenne pepper? Is it possible to overdo the cayenne pepper? In his book, Jethro Kloss, Jethro Kloss's book, Back to Eden, I think I mentioned earlier, he devotes half a page to every herb and 10 pages to cayenne pepper. And he quotes a couple of doctors in his article that use cayenne pepper. And one of them stated it's impossible to abuse cayenne pepper. <laughs> I don't know anyone that's interested in drinking half a cup of cayenne pepper. And also, if a huge amount is taken, the next day when you go to the toilet, I think you feel it a little at the other end. <laughs> so, you know, I think it is something that it's, uh, it's, it would be hard to overdo the cayenne pepper. So it's not an irritant to, to the stomach lining? No, it's not. No, it's not. One doctor said it's impossible to abuse cayenne pepper. The other doctor said it will never cause a lesion. In other words, it, it will not irritate. Now, it feels like it is only because it's a massive blood mover and that blood mover gives an awakening to the, to the nerves. And that's the, that's the tingling that, that you feel. Whereas black pepper is an irritant to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. Chili is an irritant to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. Mustard is an irritant to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. So it's important to know um, what are irritants and what aren't. Ellen White says that we shouldn't be using spices. And then some people think that she means we shouldn't be using ginger, we shouldn't be using uh, cane pepper. And that's where it's important to have a look at what these herbs contain and what their actions are, what their actions are on the body. And some people see that cane pepper is a stimulant, but it's not a nervous system stimulant, it's a blood stimulant. And the life of the flesh is in the blood, so anything that moves blood is, is actually a good stimulant. And ginger, I went to um, Fiji few years ago and the, the health retreat I went to there, they were not using ginger. And yet in the marketplace, they've, they've got piles of ginger. I said, you're not using ginger. And they said, no, we had a medical missionary here who told us we mustn't use ginger because it's a, it's a stimulant. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> then when it's time to study the herb and study its actions, ginger, ginger does warm. But ginger only warms if there's uh, inflammation in the area and it has an effect to pull that inflammation out. Ginger is an anti-inflammatory. It can get the inflammation down. So it's not hard to, to uh, Google a herb and Google what its actions are, and that's where the herb book can help. Another, and I think it's probably one of the best anti-inflammatories, so we'll look at anti-inflammatories because we've, we've had people coming off their anti-inflammatories. So what is your best anti-inflammatory? Externally, it really is ginger. But first of all, we'll look at the cold cloths, cold cloths. And that's what was important for us to do with our dear sister's knee is to get that heat out of that knee. And the quickest way to do it is with the cold cloths. As soon as they warm up, put another one on. As soon as it warms up, put another one. You just keep doing that. And grated ginger. So you grated ginger poultices. And when I take the grated ginger poultice off, what I find sometimes, after half an hour, a person says, I can't stand it, it's too hot. <laughs> we just take it off. But if they can stand it a little bit longer. Now, 
I was asking our sister, is it getting hot? But it was difficult for her to know. She has had so much nerve damage because it's inevitable that nerves can be cut in when operations happen. But um, so we just left it on. And when she took it off and dived in that beautiful, cool mountain lake, you know, if she wasn't diving in the cool mountain lake, then when you take it off, then you just wipe it over with a, with a cold cloth. And remember, finishing with cold equalizes the circulation, prevents chilling and closes the pores. So externally, they are the best, but internally. Internally, turmeric. Yeah. So how can turmeric be taken internally? You can take it in quite large doses. So I had an injury in my shoulder once. In fact, it was not responding. And so I had a, a scan to find out what was happening in there. And, and it showed that I had a full thickness tear of my supraspinatus tendon. Your supraspinatus tendon is the tendon that sits in that dip in your humerus. And your supraspinatus tendon causes your arm to go up. From about there, it's the deltoid. You know, the deltoid is this muscle here that kicks in. So I had a full thickness tear and I had a one centimeter, um, you know, gap. So I went to an orthopedic surgeon to get his opinion. And he said, hmm, that will need surgery to heal. But he said, we do keyhole surgery now. And you know what they do? They take it up on their computer and they've got a little cartoon type illustration of what he would do. It was very impressive. I said, whoa, well, that looks fairly non-invasive because he said, you've got a one centimeter retraction. And he said that that cannot heal unless it comes together. But I was a public patient because I, I do not pay into private insurance. So he said, you know, it's going to take a while. And I said, hmm, what if I just hire you to do it? How much would you charge? He said, $2,000. And I thought, oh, to have it fixed so quickly, one might consider that. He said, but then you'd have to pay the anaesthetist and then you'd have to pay the, the surgery. I said, forget it. <laughs> and so he put my name down. But you know, I found out later, he put my name down for about 10 months. And I thought to myself, why did he put me down for so long away? I think he thought that I could do it. Because he couldn't believe how much I could do already. And he could see that I was fit. And I could, by looking at him, he was in his early 50s, he was very fit. You know, and a fit person appreciates and acknowledges another fit person. So now that I knew exactly what was happening, I went home and I started to do comfrey poultices. We have comfrey growing. It was winter, so I was grating up the comfrey root and I was putting a comfrey root poultice on for four hours twice a day. It was painful and it would often be painful. And so I was taking internally turmeric and I was taking 6,000 milligrams of turmeric capsules a day. Now with the poultice on and the 6,000 milligrams of, of turmeric a day, I was getting eight out of 10 pain down to two out of 10 pain. So that's very impressive. And I had a fairly heavy schedule. I had the retreat and then the following week I was, I was traveling and I was um, giving meetings. So before the meeting, in fact, I had some tops that had big, big sleeves so I could put the <laughs> turmeric poultice underneath and you could barely see it. So that's what I did. And I did it as long as I needed to do it. So when my pain began to subside, I started to just do the poultice once a day. So that I think we did it twice a day for about three weeks. And then I started to ease off. And because it wasn't so much pain, I brought it down to 3,000 milligrams. So I just brought it less and less and did this less and less. And I have full use of that arm. There is nothing that tells me I have any injury at all. So what happened in there? I don't know. 
but I got full use of it. I'm just not prepared to pay a lot of money to have another scan to find out what's happening in there. And do I need to because I have full use of my arms there. I am limited in absolutely nothing. I can do absolutely everything with that arm. So that happened to me, I don't know, five, six years ago. So the power of comfrey with its growth stimulant, did it join them together? I don't know, it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> but can you see what you're looking at? You're looking at, you're looking at response. But that brought my pain levels right down. So if I have pain, the last thing I think of is a painkiller. And I told you my experience with this, this earache and how the, the, onion, the onion poultice certainly brought that pain right, right, right down. So this is, so you, you look for the cause, you look at the history, you look at the symptoms and, and that's absolutely what we did with our sister this morning who is uh, not in pain anymore and if she gets in pain now knows what to do. Isn't that right? So Dr. Paul Brand, he has some very interesting statements on pain. He said that if you take away the pain, you've actually taken away the alarm system. So when there's pain, it's the body saying, excuse me, there's a problem here, can you, can you do something about it? But then you've got to have a look at why the pain is there. It's like when I jumped out of the plane. I showed you, told you I had a skydive and I, I hurt my, my ankle. When, when the ambulance arrived, I'm on the ground. Uh, why did I bite my finger? Yeah, that really hurt, but it takes the edge off that pain a bit. And when the ambulance arrived, half an hour later, the first thing they did was got jumped, the paramedic jumped out with an injection for me. I said, no. He said, no. You know, when you hit your head, it's excruciating at first, but then it eases. Well, this had eased. It had just eased. It had gone from 10 out of 10 pain down to about, I don't know, 7 out of 10. I, 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 could, I could handle that. And uh, they were very surprised that I didn't want the pain killer. And what I said to them was, I want to feel that pain because that pain is going to tell me what I can and can't do. Isn't that what pain tells you? Um, oh, don't go that way. And how often do we wake in the night with a very sore arm because we've actually been lying on it and there's no blood going in it? What's it doing? It's saying, excuse me, can you get off that arm? It's painful. So we move and then the, the, uh, the pain goes away. It's training yourself to look totally different at pain. And I, I did mention that we have a lot of guests that come with um, headaches. And it's usually because they're coming off caffeine. So there is going to be a bit of a headache. But that's where the hot foot bath can really help. And why you put feet in hot water when the person's got a headache is that the Feet are a reflex for abdomen, chest and head. And so when the feet go in hot water, the congestion that is in the head is pulled down to the feet. And often cold water here, you just ask the person, does that feel good? No, no, no. What about cold here? Yeah, yeah, that feels better. You see, you're looking for your response. And also massaging the shoulders and relaxing the shoulders can certainly help. If the person has... Uh, headaches quite often, one would have a look. So you're investigating, investigating when. And sometimes ladies have headaches at period time. Now that immediately indicates they've got a hormonal imbalance. And sometimes when people say they've got migraines, I say, when did they start? And they started at the age of 13. Well, what happens at the age of 13? That's when menstruation usually begins. So that's another sign. Can you see how your investigation, searching the cause, can give you an indication as to why, why it is there? Sometimes it can be because of an accident. I think I mentioned we had a girl that had um, fallen out of an apple tree when she was 10. And then she told me that she'd fallen out of the tractor I think when she was seven and she said she had marks in her face where the barbed wire fence had, had cut her. Every fall can just put, knock your, 
knock your spine a little bit out of out of alignment and so there are some excellent experts you can go to just to have that checked and that is a chiropractor or an osteopath. Chiropractors in the old days used to just go click 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 crunch crunch that's another sound but chiropractors today the training is a little bit different and I think they have recognized that a chiropractor can go crunch crunch and then you can walk out, turn around, and your muscles will pull, pull it all back to where it was. But I really like the osteopath because they work with muscle and ligament and tendon and bone. So when I had my bad back last week, I found an osteopath in Manchester and he just stretched me. He stretched the leg up this way and the leg over that way and different positions. They know their muscles and exactly how and what stretch will affect what part of the body. And the next day, I, I'm, I, I went a jump in increase in recovery from my back by 50% because you know, I mean, they're, they're doctors of chiropractic, they're doctors of osteopathy. That's what they've studied in detail. They know their bones, their ligaments, their muscles. So that's when you can go to the experts. And I've seen people get great relief from all sorts of problems by, um, by getting a, a proper adjustment there. And I know our, our sister told us that after childbirth, her, her pelvis was a little bit out and it can be put in place by that. So... Again, you, you look at the response. Um, my husband tells a story about his mother who often used to get headaches. And as a 16-year-old girl, she was riding a horse and she went to jump over a fence and the horse decided to stop and she went flying over the fence. And, you know, the dear lady has passed now, so we're looking at probably 50 years ago. And... My husband says that when he was a little boy, she had five children, she often used to have headaches and he said he can remember visiting her in a mental institution from time to time. But as a little boy, he really doesn't know what all that was about. But a chiropractor came to town and this would have been about in the 1980s. So she went to visit the chiropractor. She, one visit, she never had another headache and she never had another visit to a a psychiatric hospital. Her, her spine was out of alignment. Our body runs according to precision balance and so this, this imbalance that can be created because of an accident, because of an injury, um, can be put back into place uh, in situations like that. Yesterday we looked at aloe vera and with aloe vera we looked at how it can be used for burns. And do you remember what you've got to keep in place with the aloe vera? The skin. In fact, I just got a text from a lady who's got very bad eczema, eczema on her legs, very bad, and she said she puts castor oil on it, but when she takes it off, it's stuck to the edges and it pulls the skin off. Oh. I said, can you go and buy some aloe vera? <laughs> Cut the spikes off. Keep the skin in place and, and wrap that on your leg. But I wanted to tell you what we do internally. So I'd like to touch on a few things that you can do internally using the herbs. So we're going to have a look at the gastrointestinal tract. I gave you a recipe yesterday for gut repair, which can coat, soothe and heal the lining of the gut. But aloe can also do that. So what we didn't get to yesterday was talking about aloe vera inside the gut. Lining the aloe vera skin is a yellow slime. And that yellow slime can be irritating to the gut. And so to use the aloe vera internally, there's a couple of things you can do. You can scrape the clear gel <clears throat> out of it and leave the yellow slime, which is right next to the skin. You can mash that up with a fork or you can blend it, put it in it. Some people put add it to their smoothies. But the aloe vera contains some special polysaccharides. Polysaccharide just means many sugars that stimulate cell-to-cell -cell communication. 
So there can be very, so not only does it help with the lining of the gut, but taken into the cell, it can help with cell communication there. In Australia, we have got a, a network that sells health products called Manatech. I don't know if you've heard of Manatech. And all of their products are basically based on aloe vera. And in their advertising, they certainly talk about this cell to cell communication. But, yeah? Manatech. We um we don't use Manatech, but I I think that's it. But what I the reason I mentioned it is because they have some quite remarkable products and people have testified, but it really is just basically aloe vera. We have a lot of aloe vera at Misty Mountain Health Retreat. I wouldn't be surprised if we have ten thousand plants. I haven't taken the time to count them but they have really uh, got out of control. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, your southern wall is your, su your, is your sunny wall, is that right? So down the bottom, our sun wall is our northern wall. And I put aloe vera in different spots but didn't do very well. And then on the western wall, I think no matter where you are, the sun sets in the west, doesn't it? Yeah. So on our western wall, I planted a few plants and within a couple of months, they had just multiplied, multiplied. And now we have thousands of plants. So what we do is the staff cut two or three big leaves about this long of the, in, the, in the afternoon, like four o'clock. They take them inside and they put them in a glass jar or glass cup and in one hour, all the yellow slime drains out. So the yellow slime drains out, and you can see it in the bottom of the jar in a, you know, a lump of yellow. Some of our staff like to put a little bit of water in and put it in. So after one hour, the yellow slime has drained out, and then they wash it, just cut the bottom off, and then slice the, so if your aloe vera is like this, you slice it this way. And I would say at an estimate, you've got three big leaves and we cut that up and put it in two litres of water. And so through the water is floating all the little strips of aloe vera. And we let that sit overnight. And in the morning, the first thing our guests have is aloe water with a squeeze of lemon. So our exercise coordinator who does the morning wake up and gives the morning drinks, he strains it and everyone's got a glass of aloe water. What does that aloe water do? That aloe water contains vitamin B12 because vitamin B12 is an airborne bacteria. That aloe has a natural probiotic in it. And that aloe with its, I don't know how else to say it, but slime, <laughs> Now the water, because it sat in the water all night, is a little thick, so that's coating and soothing the first drink that goes down in the morning. So what we do then is once Howard's drained all the water out, then we fill the jar up with water again. And then we pour that water with the little bits of aloe in it into two jugs, and we put you know half a dozen mint leaves in, and all through the day the guests drink that. They drink that. And especially those that have any inflammation in their gastrointestinal tract, that aloe water is very, very soothing. The next day, we discard that and we have our next batch. So every afternoon at four o'clock, whoever's on duty in the health center, they cut the leaves, they let them sit for an hour, and they drink that aloe through the day. It's not an exciting taste. You wouldn't say it was a terribly pleasant taste. And that's why I put the mint leaves in. But the mint leaves are enough to mask it a little bit. And in the morning when they have their warm lemon water, the, the lemon is enough to mask it. So that's how you can use the aloe vera in the gastrointestinal tract. There's a question. Uh, when you put the, the leaves, you put the first time you put them in a glass of the, the yellow, um, it, out. Yeah. it came out by itself. It just drains out, yeah. It leaf was intact. That's right. But it drains out.
Yeah, it's the bitter part and that's the irritating part. And afterwards you put the water in. So after that we wash it, we wash all the yellow slime away and then we cut it up and put it in fresh water. With the skin? Yeah. Yeah, it actually looks very pretty, <laughs> these, these little slices. Are these plants winter hard? We get frost and at the moment in Australia in the morning it's, it's zero Celsius in the morning. So, but they're happy because they're on the western wall and they're, they're on the wall and you know that the frost doesn't come right up to the house. The frost is usually a little bit back. So your plants that are right next to the house. So I know that you get snow here, but you, you have your plants in pots and have them, I imagine, inside in sunny spots in the, in the winter time. All you have to do is find someone with aloe vera and get some of the little pups. You know, they call the little new ones pups. Is that what you call them? The, the new little shoots, because they just multiply, especially if you give them the right condition. Yes, for the strength, do you use the old leaves or the new leaves? Usually, well, usually the, the new ones, the nice developed ones, and it's barbadensis. I think that's the spelling. The bar that's the type of aloe vera, because there are a few different types of aloe vera, but, but that's the one that that's that you want that's the one that uh, you want to go for. Yesterday we looked at some bitter herbs to stimulate hydrochloric acid. We also looked at the gut repair mix that had slippery elm, golden seal and myrrh. But now I want to come down to the colon and what mix of herbs can you use to stimulate bowel movement? And the one we use, we call it colon tea. And colon tea is one part cascara. Cascara sagrada. If you only use cascara sagrada, it can, it can cause cramping. It's very, very strong. It's incredibly bitter. So we use two parts, licorice. Licorice is a very sweet herb and licorice, licorice is a little bit um, uh, lubricant-y, a little like mucilage, so it can, it can contribute to uh, lining the gut. And three-part buckthorn. Buckthorn is a relative of Cascara sagrada. So what we've got with Cascara Sagrada and Buckthorn, we have bark. So these two are bark, whereas the licorice is a root. So students, can you remember how you prepare the, the bark? You have to boil it, yeah, gentle simmer. So the rule of thumb is, you remember the rule of thumb is one teaspoon of the dried herb to one cup of water. And then because they're roots and barks, there's a gentle simmer for approximately 10 minutes. And then you let it sit. It's important to let it sit because as, as it's cooling, a lot more of the actives are going into the water. So what's the dose? So, pardon? Teaspoon per cup. Yeah, that's the recipe. So the dose meaning how much do you give to the person? So at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, when the guests come in, we always ask them how many times do you go to the toilet a day or how many bowel movements. Now, if the guest says, I go every day, then on the juicing days, so they start juicing Monday, we will give this, them this tea on Sunday night. So if they say they go every day, and ideally we should go twice a day. So, and Dr. Kellogg said once a day is constipation. Did you know that? He said three intakes of food should equal three evacuations. And so we give them half a cup before they go to bed. If they say, I go every two days, we give them one cup before they go to bed. 
If they say, I go four times a day, we don't usually give them anything <laughs> because they might be the ones that will continue to go on the detox. Now, if on Monday they've started their juicing, if they have not evacuated by the middle of the day, we give them another half cup. So can you see you're very much looking at response. And if someone comes to me in the morning and says, Barbara, I've been four times this morning, then we give them slippery elm. Remember slippery elm? Remember how it goes thick when you put water with it? It'll slow down. It'll coat and soothe and slow down. So you're looking for response. Only once or twice in many years have we needed to give three cups a day. We had a psychologist do our program. She said, I go once a week with help. And I said, we'll get you going. <laughs> so we did the castor oil compressors on her abdomen. Remember the castor oil penetrates very deep. We got her to sit in the creek. In this retreat, we did not have the sit spas. So we just got her to squat in the creek twice a day for 10 minutes, just squat in the creek. So that cold water has a stimulating effect. If the woman was a little underweight, I would probably get her to sit for maybe five minutes <laughs> because she would not be able to handle the cold as much. And we gave three colon teas a day. We gave a cup of tea at night, we gave a cup of tea in the morning, and we gave a cup of tea in the middle of the day, and then by the end of the day she had a movement. So we gave her three cups of the colon tea a day. The tea is black, looks like coffee, does not taste like coffee. For some people it has a bitter taste with a sweet aftertaste, that's the licorice. For some people it has a sweet initial taste and then a bitter aftertaste. Some people love it, some people hate it, most people say I can handle it. So it's good for you to make that tea and it's good for you to drink it and, and just see what it does with you. What I find is for most people, it, they just go like they usually go. And yet if they weren't taking the tea, their colon would stop because on the two days of juices, there's no fibre going in. So again, you're, you're, what, you're watching that. So this lady, this psychologist who went once a week with help, she started to go twice a day. By the end of the week, her skin was a different colour. It was almost a grey colour when she came. It was pink. The whites of her eyes became white. You see, how would your kitchen be if you only emptied that garbage bin once a week? <laughs> the smell in the kitchen would be terrible. You know what that smell tells you? This, this, is, this is bad. This is an unhealthy situation. So she went home a very happy lady. She went home armed with the tea, the castor oil for her compresses. She'd made a drastic lifestyle change. She started to drink more water. She detoxed off her caffeines. So she was so excited about the results, about how she felt. She said, my mind is so clear. She said, maybe this is the problem with most of my patients. The colon's not working. And so as she implemented the true remedies, as well as taking the tea, she, she gave me feedback. She told me this five months later. She said, I kept taking three cups a day and I went twice a day. She said, after six weeks, I started going four times a day. So she said, I brought it back to two cups a day and I went twice a day. After six weeks, I started going four times a day. So she brought it back to once a day and she went twice a day. After six weeks she started going four times a day so she stopped the tea. Isn't that incredible? So after I think it was five months this lady who had this, this lady was in her 60s, she'd had this problem for a long time. It appears that the herbs, and do you remember what Psalm 104 verse 14 tells you? God gave herbs for that? Service of man. It appears that the herbs waken up the colon. They actually teach it how to work again. So the herbs gently restore and revive colon function. I don't know anything that will do that. 
I've met people that have been on laxatives for 20 years. What we need to do is wake up and train. But remember, you would not have that effect if, if the true remedies weren't implemented. Because a lot of people have constipation because of dehydration, because of a refined diet, because of stress, you know, a whole lot of different things. And sometimes they could have, you know, maybe as a child they could have been punished if they went to the toilet when they shouldn't and, and sometimes that can affect their, their colon habits as they get older. I homeschooled my children and what I noticed is after every meal, because our toilet, because we lived in a rainforest, no electricity, our toilet was a, we, in Australia, have you heard of the long drop? <laughs> it's a huge big hole about 20 foot deep and then they build a little <laughs> hut over it and put a toilet on, it's called the long drop. <laughs> And maybe it fills up after about two years and you have to go and dig another hole and have another long drop. But where that was, you put a fruit tree there and you get pretty nice fruit off it. And so, yeah, our toilet was the, was the long drop up, up the hill a little bit. And, it was, and we had fruit trees between the, the toilet and the house. And after every meal, I could not find my children anywhere and there they were lined up at the fruit trees. And the elder children are dictating who goes next <laughs> after every meal. That is the most natural time to go. One lady said, Barbara, every time I eat a meal, it's not long before I'm on the toilet and it's out. I said, no, no that's a couple of meals ago. <laughs> because when you eat a meal and you begin the process of peristalsis, that goes all the way down. So the most natural time to go is actually after a meal. But so many people have so many bad habits of lifetimes that, you know, not, not everyone actually goes according to what the body was originally planned to do. But habits can change little by little by little, given our four-letter word, time. So I was very appreciative of that lady giving me feedback that showed um, how how the, uh, these herbs gently revived and restored her colon function. Aloe vera can be used for irritable bowel and aloe vera can be used for Crohn's disease and aloe vera can also be used for constipation, so for, for all problems in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, what the slippery elm contains and what the aloe, aloe vera contains. They're rich in slimy mucilage and the inside of your gastrointestinal tract is just like the inside of your lip there. It's, it's like a, a, a mucousy covering. So it's rich in slimy mucilage and that's why they are so good for the gastrointestinal tract. Mucilage. Like something like that. There is another herb, and that's marshmallow. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with it, and I also recognise there might be a different name. In um, uh, you familiar with uh, um, the? It's a flower that cottage gardens often have hollyhocks. It's a relative of the hollyhock, but it, it has a. It has a leaf that looks a little bit like this. I think you saw before Lerth came on. Lerth, Lerth. And it's a, it's a soft, it's a soft leaf. But if you pour boiling water on those leaves and drink the tea, you'll see the thickness. It's almost like a thickness that comes. So the marshmallow also can be drank as a tea to help with the lining of the gut. And there are a couple of other herbs that are excellent. Now in our next, uh, in our next session, we're going to go outside and you'll see there's a beautiful peppermint uh, plant outside. Peppermint is a soother on the gut. So if someone has an upset stomach, hot peppermint tea can be very nice. Peppermint tea can be also nice if someone has a sore throat or a cold. 
One of my favorites is a combination of peppermint tea and ginger tea. And you can make that by even putting fine slices in a cup and pouring boiling water in. Or if you want it really strong, you grate it and put it into a little teapot and pour that in. Also, um, fennel. Fennel is very nice on the gut. And I think there are some fennel plants out in the garden. Uh, so you could actually classify these as digestive aids. When the fennel goes to seed, uh, the little seeds on the fennel plant can be chewed on and that's a nice digestive aid. When I visit my daughter in America, whenever we go to town, there's a great Indian shop and they have a selection of vegetarian Indian. And when you've finished and you're going out, they always have a bowl of fennel seeds. And you can take some fennel seeds as they're a digestive aid. So there's our digestion. I also wanted to have a look at liver. What are some good liver herbs? I think we touched on this the other day when we looked at the liver. But some of them I want to look at and show you that they can be used also for other areas. So the liver herbs that I talked about the other day were St. Mary's thistle, and that's sometimes called milk thistle. So even though it is a very bitter herb and it isn't one of the best herbs for the liver, it's called milk thistle. Is that because it's got a milk? Actually, the reason it's called milk thistle is because it can boost mother's milk. So if a lady feels that her milk supply is lacking, she could take St. Mary's thistle. You can get it in a capsule or a tablet form. I often get emails from women asking me how they can boost their supply, but there really is just one way to boost the supply. Just put the baby on the breast a little bit more often because with the nipple and the breast, it's just demand and supply. <laughs> and I know if my baby had a cold or a little bit of a fever, I would let them suckle a little bit more that day. Maybe they'd have a little suckle nearly every hour because it soothed them and they were getting the fluid. Well, two days later, I had a lot of milk. <laughs> the supply really went up just from that constant. Um, sucking. As a rule, I would feed my babies about every three hours, but then there are exceptions when, when the baby might be sick. Now the beauty of that is if the baby's got a fever or they're not well, they will suckle because of the comfort, but they're getting more fluid into them. <laughs> and, and that's what you want when they're recovering from sickness. So that's good to remember that the St. Mary's thistle, also called milk thistle, can boost milk supply. Dandelion. So here's liver. Dandelion also is very beneficial for the kidneys. And it is what is termed a diuretic, a substance that will stimulate the kidneys to let go more urine to help with swelling of the, of the legs. So whenever there's swelling in the legs, if the person goes to the doctor, the doctor will put them on a diuretic. So we had a man come, yes? Would you drink it as a tea or eat it more? You can drink it as a tea, but most people don't like the tea because it's not very pleasant. So you could take it in a tincture form or you could take it, we have made it into a tincture form to buy the dried root. Um, you could take it in a tablet form, a capsule form. With the bitter herbs, sometimes it's a good idea to do that because it's not a pleasant tea. And what I have discovered at the health retreat is people, as a rule, are used to sweet drinks. They are not used to bitter drinks. And so when they're very, very bitter, to have it in a tincture form, and in a tincture form is easier for them to take because it's in a glycerin tincture and vegetable glycerin is a sweet, makes it fairly sweet. 
So we had a 92-year-old man come and do our program and he was on a diuretic along with a lot of other um, medications. And I said to him, if you would like to try, I can give you dandelion tincture three times a day uh, instead of your diuretic. Would you like to try that? He said, yes, I would. He said, I, I would like to ease off some of my medication. And the next day he said, that dandelion is more effective than the medical diuretic I've been taking. So that's also good to remember. So dandelion is good for the kidneys. Some specifics for the kidneys are celery. So celery can be taken as celery seeds. You can even get celery seed tablets or capsules. Uh, juicing, juicing celery. Celery juice isn't very exciting by itself, but you could have half celery, half carrot, and, and that's quite pleasant. And parsley. Parsley is also uh, an excellent kidney herb. So if someone has kidney problems, they could include celery and parsley into their food every day. It's not hard to chop up parsley and put it on everything. And then you've got dishes like tabbouleh, which is a huge amount of parsley, very finely chopped. So the other kidney herb is gentian. Uh, these, these three are very bitter, very bitter herbs. So the, are there any questions? I think we've just about covered everything that I wanted to cover for you. What is the bitter, bitter um, element that is stimulating people? Uh, that, that I can't tell you. But you could, you could look up the actives that are the, the bitter ones. Now, 15 years ago when I... When I was studying the herbs, I could probably tell you off the top of my head, but um, they're long names, but they are there. You can, if you look in the actives of the of the uh, herb, uh, if you get information which lists the actives, you can you can see that. What's what I'm seeing is what uh, what are they doing with the kidneys? It's just stimulating the functions. Of That's right. Yeah. Oh, also, the uh, dandelion definitely stimulates the function, but the celery and the parsley seem to contribute to the cleansing and the, and the strengthening of the kidney. I have a girlfriend and she has to go to the bathroom because of urination very often during the night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the urethra is a muscle and that can be strengthened. So if someone has incontinence or get the feeling to go quite often, when they do urinate, that can stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. So that takes a lot of control, but that very action helps to strengthen the muscle and rebounding. But if someone uh, has a urethra that's not strong, before they get on the rebounder, they should empty their bladder. <laughs> Because as soon as they start jumping on the rebounder, they might have a little leak. And you remember we talked about the yoni stones, the, the internal stones that strengthen the uh, pelvic girdle and the urethra is part of that pelvic girdle. It, re it really is muscle, muscle tone. And whether you're 9 or 90, you can have strong muscle tone. Any questions before we close, yes? Is there anything against nerve pain? Nerve pain. Now, yesterday we looked at some uh, mild tranquilizers, mild sedatives, and we included St. John's wort. St. John's wort is a remarkable herb, and it is a nerve nourisher, which means it nourishes the nerves. So to... To help with nerve pain, that can be taken internally. You can get St. John's wort oil. Now, if you ever make St. John's wort oil, what you do is you collect the buds in spring. And you collect the buds because when you press a, blood, a bud between your finger, it will go red. They think that's why it's called St. John's wort. 
and that's what you want to make your oil with. And you, you just put it into olive oil and you'll find after a couple of months the olive oil goes red. Almost the colour of this lady's dress here. And so what you can do for someone with nerve pain, it, it can be massaged into the area. For someone's highly stressed out, the St John's wort can be massaged into their spine. And it can be taken... Uh, by mouth to the St John's Ward. You're probably best to get it in a tablet form and then you can get it in a concentrated, concentrated form. But it is very difficult. I have met people who, you know, have had terrible nerve pain after surgery and that's, that's very difficult. The hot and colds, getting the blood supply. Remember your blood supply to the area feeds your nerves because the blood has the oxygen, it has the water, it has the nutrient, it takes away waste. So you're hot and cold, but, you, but you're looking for response. You're always looking for response. When you see the response, when you see the, the shoulders relax and you see a person looking relaxed, you know, straight away you've, you've got a good response there. Would it even help with severed nerves, like in the case of Irene? Yeah, it may do. It's worth a try. It's certainly worth a try. Something I didn't mention yesterday about comfrey. I have read this. I even had a lady tell me this once. And that is that if you apply comfrey to any area, a comfrey poultice where there are spare parts, and what I mean by spare parts is screws or you know, um, it can pull them out. And this lady told me that it bent the screw on her brother's leg. Well, our dear sister this morning had many plates and screws from all the operations she's had. And she said, you know, the strange thing is those screws and plates just came out. Obviously, they didn't just cut out, but little by little they made their way out. And her doctor said he had never seen such a thing. And I said, what had you been applying? And she said, comfrey. <laughs> so comfrey has pulled it out. Would, would castor oil do that also? No. No, it's only comfrey that I know that does that. So castor oil rather disintegrates. Um... Yeah, it pe yes, it penetrates in and it'll cleanse the area and it'll cause a breakdown and a, of uh, any unnatural formation in the body, meaning that something that the body's grown, like your tumours or your bone spurs or calcified deposits or um, fibroids or cysts, that, that's what it can break down. <laughs>